and all right in our weekly Bible study this week. We are in Genesis chapter number 2. We are going to begin reading in verse number 1. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. So I referenced when we read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, I referenced Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. And I want to do that again. If you flip over to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, In the, be in the beginning God created the heaven." And the earth. So if you look closely there, you will notice that heaven in Genesis 1 1 is singular. And then when you look in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, it is plural. So there is a dividing from the point of Genesis 1 1 to Genesis chapter 2 when God is creating you know, the firmament and all of these different things. At some point, he makes a division. There's a demarcation or a delineation point of one heaven, and then there's another heaven. And I want to show that to you further. Look at the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse number 1. We get a little bit more lighter clarity on this subject of there being, you know, plural heavens. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse number 1. This is, of course, Paul's writings, 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse number 1. The Bible says, it is not expedient. That's like advantageous. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. And then he says this, such an one caught up to the third heaven. It's so interesting how the New Testament in so many different ways or areas can teach you things about the Old Testament. Just proving that Jesus Christ truly was the God of the Old Testament. Just proving that Jesus was the Christ, the fulfillment of the Messiah of the Old Testament. All the different nuggets and revelations and the, uh, the, the, the clarity that can be put on when you start in the New Testament in this sense and then look back in the Old Testament. You read the Old Testament and then the New Testament, you can look back and learn new things. So we see here that he says that he was caught up to the third heaven, obviously proving that there are at least three heavens. The third heaven here would be paradise. So we would see that this is the that there are only three heavens. That is obviously where God dwells. There's nothing higher than, than where God dwells. He references hell and then heaven. So there's uh, where God dwells. That is. So there is the that is the uh, you know the extremity of space is the third heaven, proving that this is talking about where God dwells. Look at verse number four. How that he was caught up into paradise. So he repeats it there and he says it's paradise. And we see when we look at the book of Revelation that where the tree of life is, that is paradise. So we can see that that is obviously speaking of heaven. It's very clear when we look at it. No one would doubt that when they look in the book of Revelation. Paradise isn't in the center of the earth. It's in heaven. It's in the third heaven. So we can see there the plural heavens being spoken of. And he tells you that the third heaven is where God dwells. The first heaven, we, we, it would make the most sense that's closest to us is just where the birds fly and all of that. And then the second heaven is what? There's a major difference between that part of our atmosphere and then where space is, right? What we consider outer space. If we were to just break down, you know, uh, the science and then, you know, looking from a biblical perspective, we know that God lives in heaven and that's referred <laughs> to as heaven. Those are the clear <laughs> lines of the three heavens. Those are obvious you know, that is obvious that those are the three heavens of the God that the Bible is speaking of. Go back to Genesis chapter 2. Let's look at verse number 2. So verse 1 says that everything was created in chapter number 1. In six days we know that that took place. And then it says this in, in uh, chapter 2, verse 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Verse 3, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Sanctified means set it apart. It's not, it's, there's something different about it, right? And sanctified it because, now this is the reason why it's sanctified at this time, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. That's an interesting concept because does God have to rest? No. The book of Isaiah actually says that he does not grow weary. God does not grow weary. So the only reason in which he would have rested is to be an example unto us. I want you to turn in your Bibles. Go to the, the New Testament. Actually, let's look at the Old Testament first. 
in Exodus chapter number 20. I want to look at where God actually institutes this as a law. So we see that God rests here on the, set, on the seventh day. Go to Exodus chapter number 20. Now, uh, just for reference sake, just to learn your Bible better, the first time that the word Sabbath is used is Exodus chapter number 16. Exodus 16, verse 23. That is the very first time that the word Sabbath occurs in your Bible. And the Sabbath is a word you know, that uh, is oftentimes used to refer to the, uh, the seventh day of the week. The seventh day of the week. So there in Exodus chapter number 20, this is where God gives the law. I want you to look at Exodus chapter 20, and I want you to look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now what does holy mean? Set apart means sanctified. So set it apart the same way in which God sanctified that day. You need to keep that day holy. Notice that? So that is why, number one, that is the reason why God rested on that day. And it says afterwards that he blessed that day, right? And he sanctified it. Then later on, the Bible, when God gives those commandments, he says, keep that day holy. Right? So it would be, God did it so that we could follow his example going forward. Keep reading there, verse 10. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord... I'm sorry, verse 9. I skipped verse 9. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Verse 11, we read this last week. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. We just read that, and it says, and hallowed it. That is another word for sanctified or set apart or made holy, right? He hallowed it. Okay, so we can see here the six days he created it. He rested the seventh day, and he set that example for us. And one thing else that we can uh, learn from this, when we look back at the old text, or we look back at the creation of the world, when, when God rests on that seventh day. Go, I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter number four real quick. When, uh, when God rests on that seventh day, he's setting that example for us. But there is a reason why God did that to set an example for us. Not just so that we would rest on the seventh day. I think it is good for health reasons to have one day out of the week to rest from your labor. I think that's good for you. I think there's practical reasons for that. There are practical reasons for all of God's law, right? We can find practical reasons even in the moral law. That, you know, the, There's practicality to that. Uh, but here in Hebrews chapter number 4, we find... The main reason why God rested on that day and for it to be an example for us going forward. Look at Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1. The Bible says, Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. Verse 2, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now look at verse 3. For we which have believed... Do enter into, do enter into rest. So notice what he said right there, talking about believing the gospel once you get saved. He's saying at the moment that you believe, you enter into rest. You know, this right here proves, you know, that salvation is by grace through faith alone also. It proves that after you're saved, you don't have to try to retain or keep your own salvation. You enter into rest. You're not working anymore. Look at what it says next. With that thought in mind, it says this. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest. And he says, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So we can see the works that God did in those six days. Those days, actually, of God working, picture the work that the Lord Jesus Christ, that that God, that same one God, would do for us. And then we would just believe and trust in him, and then we get to rest. We get to rest in Christ. Keep reading what it says in verse number 4. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. So it tells you that he's talking about the seventh day, the Sabbath day. It says, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Verse 5, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached... Enter not in because of unbelief. Uh, skip down to verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. And it says this, verse 10. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works. So notice, again, you cease from your own works. If you've entered into his rest. 
It's very interesting because Jesus Christ said, when they accused him of, of, of working on the Sabbath day, he said, my father worketh hitherto and I work. Because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, you know, was God. You know, he was the one that actually created that, and that is his rest. And then he came to do that work for us, and then he rose again, and all we did, we just put our faith only in him. He did everything on the cross, his death, his burial. He was in hell paying for our sins while people were just resting on the Sabbath day. And God took this very serious in the Old Testament. A man one, at one time, you know, was out picking up sticks. He was just doing work probably for a fire or what have you. And, and God had a law that you were to be put to death. They, they put that man in prison or in, in some sort of chamber and then they sought the mind of the Lord and God ended up saying to put him to death because that's the law. God is not a God of exceptions. You know, he, he is a righteous God. I want you to go back to uh, Colossians chapter number two. In the New Testament, we are not to follow the Sabbath. We do not have to. Let me say that. Because if you, if you wanted to keep the Sabbath, the Bible says that you can do that if you want. If you want to eat, not eat certain foods, you know, you can do that. But, you, you know, obviously you need to understand that all things are, you don't need to, you shouldn't be going against Scripture. You need to understand that everything is clean. If there's a reason why you just say, hey, I don't want to eat that, that's fine. If you just want to keep the Sabbath day for whatever reason, you can. But you need to understand that Christ is your rest. The Bible says in Colossians chapter number 2, verse number 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, watch this, or of the Sabbath days. So don't let anyone judge you about the Sabbath days. Look at what it says next, verse 17. Which are, so all the things that we just read about, that's including the Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come, and then it says this, but the body is of Christ. So all of those things were shadows of things to come, but the body, the one that's casting the shadows... They were shadows of the body of Christ, right? It was representing the Lord Jesus Christ because he was the one that would one day, you know, uh, allow us to enter into his rest, the rest of salvation. That was the whole purpose that God rested on the seventh day. God does not grow weary, weary. God did not get tired after, like, you know, the six days of work. Like, man, I should have, you know, slowed down a little bit. I, maybe I should have done this in, in, in ten days. No, that's not what happened. God does not grow weary. God only rested to be an example for us. He then implemented the Sabbath day, and it was holy unto the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, just like it was holy unto him. He set that example. They kept that Sabbath day all, all the way up until the time in which Jesus came, lived on this earth. He died, he was buried, and his soul went down to hell. And while he was in hell paying the price for our sins, doing the work for us, Everyone was just sitting there resting, which was a picture that he does all the work, and you don't need to do anything for your salvation. That's why it says we enter into his rest, because he's the one that did the work. That's the whole purpose why God rested on the seventh day. It was meant to be a shadow of things to come. I don't know if you figured this out yet, but every single thing in the Bible points to Jesus. Everything. It doesn't matter what you, we want to talk about, what you want to look at. You may come up with something that I don't have an answer for, but I can guarantee you that in the future I can find where it points to Jesus. Because the whole book is about Jesus. All the prophets preached about Jesus, the Bible says. And then give all the prophet, prophets witness. Everything is about Jesus. Amen. I want you to go back to Genesis chapter number 2. Genesis chapter number 2. Let's look in uh, verse number 4. Let's look at verse number 4 now. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth. So he's saying this is, this is the, the generations of when he made these. Correct? Keep reading, it says, And when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So he says, In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth. I want to point out one thing before we uh, go on. I forgot to write this down in my notes, but I've thought about this in the past. You know, I believe that the, the day of the Lord begins on a specific day, and there are a lot of references that point to that specific day, but I believe that that day spans a period of time. And it is just, it is just in, uh, speaking of the time of God's wrath. Because when you look at the day of the Lord in the Old Testament, it will describe punishments that may start on the actual day when we are raptured and His, and his wrath begins. But then there are also punishments that are called that are, are said to, to happen in the day of the Lord that take place after that. That are maybe the, you know, the third vial or one of the other trumpets, right? 
But it's still said to happen on the day of the Lord. That is because I believe the day of the Lord is that period of time. And sometimes a day is referring to a period of time. The proof of that is in verse 4, where it says, In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, did he do it in a singular day? He did not. Now, the, uh, you know, people that believe in the day-age theory will try to use this verse. But you can't use this verse for multiple reasons. Number one, you, you, you have to use, you know, in this sense, day is very clearly not referring to one specific day because we just read, number one, about six days that he created, right? We read about six literal days and he compared it unto a, a, uh, six days that he, that he made the earth in Genesis 1 and then it says that he rested on the seventh day in Genesis chapter number 2 that we just read about there. And when we looked at Exodus chapter number 20 and compared the two, God actually tells them, just like I worked six days and then rested on the seventh day, I want you to work six days and rest on the seventh day. So they're exactly the same. The six-day work way, he compares the two, and if he wasn't, you know, if they weren't the same, then he wouldn't be able to compare the two. You wouldn't be able to do that. Now, right here we can see an instance. This, is, this goes back to why I'm a fundamentalist. It's clear it's six days. It's clear. Amen. Okay? It's just what the Bible says. And then when we get here, it tells you, these are the generations. Isn't that a bad word? These are the just, this, is, this is just when they were created. Generations comes from, what's a generator? It creates electricity. It's the point at which the, it's the source, right? It's saying this, these are the generations. These are when these things were made. It's being bad. You understand what I'm saying? These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth. When they were created. So they, they, these are the generations. And then he says this. In the day that the Lord. He's just saying in the time that the Lord God. So this period of time is, is when God made these. In this week is what he's talking about. These seven days. It's very clear. you know. And then you get here. And it's obvious that day here is not speaking of a, a one literal day. Because we just read of six days. So it's very clear. Go to verse number five. The only people that believe that, let me say this, the only people that believe that are people that just believe evolution over the Bible. That's all that it is. They believe man-made science over the Bible. When you read the Bible, this is not an argument. It's not a discussion. It's very, very clear in the Bible. Look at verse number five. The Bible says, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. Now, I believe it's verse five. I'm not 100% positive of this. Uh, but didn't that guy in Arizona teach that verse number five is talking about where God created things in heaven first? Am I right about that or no? I have to cut this part out of the sermon when I upload it to YouTube. I, I thought that he did, but that's not what this is teaching. Now, I thought that he taught that, uh, that in verse five, God first created these things before they grew on earth. He created them in heaven. And now I'm almost positive. I am, I am right about that. I'm getting more confident as I think about this. I'm positive that that's what he said. I'm going to look this up, but I'm 99.9% .9 positive. He said that this is actually saying that God first created these things in heaven before they grew or plant, were planted on earth, and then they grew here. That's not what this is saying. Look at verse number four, again, where we just read. These are the generations that saying when these things were created. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and... We're, not, we're still talking about the same thing. You, see, you, know, you notice that? And every plant. So what, are, what, is the, what is this tying back to when God made these things? Do you understand? The generations of every plant as well. And every plant of the field. And then he's just saying this. Before it was in the earth and every herb of the field, before it grew. He's saying before they were made. This is, this is the time in which they were made. Before they grew on the earth. Before they were actually planted and God planted them. You know, this is the record of when God did that and planted them for the first time. Because everyone, you know, it'd be like this if you were thinking, when, you know, you know, even a person from a secular perspective, they would say, who was the first man? Because you could do math and just figure out logically that we all go back to, you know, one man, one woman, right? Whatever you believe in. It doesn't even matter if somebody believes in evolution or not in that sense, right? There was the first plant, too. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when was the first plant that grew? He's saying this is, this is when the first plant that was planted in the ground. This is when the generations, this is all one continual statement. One continual uh, statement about, you know, the generations of the world. When the things were created. At the time in which they were created. And then it says this. Proof of that even further is this. Right after it says, before it grew, it says this. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain 
upon the earth, and he says this, and there was not a man to till the ground, saying at the time in which he created these, these, these things before he created man. Look at verse 6. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. My whole life I've heard that God created everything by his word, but he created man with his hands because it says he formed him. That's not true. Because John 1 verse 3, I believe, says that without him there was not anything made that was made. That's talking about God and his word. So even the word of God created man. Even the word of God is what formed him. He did that by the word of his mouth. And then it says this, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And then it says this also, And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then man, it says, became a living soul. So man became a living soul. Turn to Job chapter number 10, verse number 8. So man, just like if you would have noticed all the other animals, you know, uh, the, the fowls of the air and then the sea creatures, they were created out of the sea. And then all the beasts of the earth, the cattle, the creeping things, they were all created right out of the ground, right? Straight out of the, the dirt, the earth, the Bible calls it, right? Well, man also was created in the same way in which they were out of the dirt, those that lived on earth. And how did he create the other animals, the cattle and all those things that came out of the ground? What did he do? Spoke the word of God. So there's no difference when he created man. Our first you know, proof, proof scripture would be John 1, 3, that without him there was not anything made that was made. I mean, the point there is clear. There was nothing made without God and his word. God and his word created everything. So I need to turn to Job chapter number 10. Job chapter number 10, I want you to look at verse number 8. Job chapter number 10, look at verse number 8. The Bible says, Thine hands have made me and fashioned me together round about, yet thou dost destroy me. And then he says, verse 9, Remember I beseech thee that thou hast made me as the clay, and wilt thou bring me into dust again. So this is the verse that I believe. I looked this up to see if there was any verses where it says that his hands created him. And this is the verse that said it. But you know what? The Bible says that his hands created the heavens, that his hands spanned the heavens. But how did he create the heavens? God, he spoke everything into existence. Amen. So our major, our final authority is John 1, 3, a super clear scripture that says there was not anything made without God's word. There was not anything made without God's word. That's our starting point. And then we find all these scriptures that talk about his hands creating things, but we go back and we read the actual record, and what does he do? He speaks it into existence. The hands are being poetic. And you know where you find every time where, where, uh, you know, where it says that God created things by his hands? Do you know what books you find them in every single time? The poetry books. That everyone knows and considers these poetry books. Job and Psalms. That's where it continually says that God created things with his hands. That he expanded the heaven with his hands. That he stretched it out with his hands. You know, this, this is uh, you know, poetic language. We see that God created everything by his words. So it's just being poetic. It's just you know, speaking in a, a figurative, you know, a poetic way. I want you to look also, go over to, to Psalms. Uh, Psalm 139, verse 14. Psalm 139, verse 14. I quoted this last week, but it's relevant, more relevant now. So I want to read it quickly. Psalm 139, verse 14. The Bible says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And then he says, and that my soul knoweth right well. So David says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I made a reference also to how David did not know about DNA. David did not know a lot about a lot of things that we know about in science today. David didn't understand the elements in which we're created of. You know what's interesting? If you look at the elements of the dirt... You know, a lot of different scientists have studied these, these different things that are creation scientists. But you look at the elements of the ground, of the dirt, it's the exact same elements that are in your body. And that's not interesting to you. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, potassium, sodium, you know, uh, phosphorus, uh, you, know, uh, you know, fluorine even. There are portions of fluorine, which is fluoride, you know, that, that's naturally occurring fluoride, you know, in your body. These are all elements that are found in the ground, all of them, and they're all in your body. All of those same elements are in just a single cell of dirt. You can find all of that. You know, not in a single cell of dirt, but in dirt itself. When you look at dirt and what it's composed of, 
That is the same elements that are in your body that are in the dirt. That's not interesting. And the Bible says that man was created from the ground. Right. And then you look at the ground, same genetic makeup, same chemical structure. That's super interesting. Amen. Just continually. When you study science, you study it with the Bible in one hand and science in the other. They just line up perfectly. Because the guy that created this world is the one that wrote this book. That's right. So they're always going to line up. And if it doesn't, then the science is wrong. Right. The science falsely so-called. You know, so the Bible just continually proves itself. The more discoveries we make, the more we find out that the Bible is true all along. And it will be forever. This book is beyond, you know, the knowledge that man has. It's always ahead of mankind. Always is and always will be. I want you to turn to Isaiah uh, chapter 45. Let's look at Isaiah chapter number 45, verse 12. Isaiah chapter number 45, verse 12. Isaiah chapter number 45. Uh, let's look at verse 11 first. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One, not three, the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel and His Maker, His, singular, actually that's referring to man. And I'm getting a little overzealous here about the oneness of God. And his maker asked me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, commanding me. And then he says, I want you to watch this. Here, see the singularity here as well. Now I look at it a second time. This wasn't the point of it. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their hosts have I commanded. So God says, I'm the creator of all the earth. I, and then notice what he says here. We learn a couple of things that we were just talking about. Number one, he says, I have made the earth and created man upon it. We just read the record of that, right? But notice right before he says that, thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. And then he says, he's telling you, you want to know who I am? I have made the earth. And then he says this, and created man upon it. How many people are speaking right now? And then he says, and then he says, even in that passage, even my hands, my is singular, even my hands. So a Trinitarian that believes in, you know, three persons and that these three persons just equally contributed to the process of creation. What are all three speaking in unison right now? Even my hands, all of them speaking in singularity of themselves, but they're all three speaking in unison. It's preposterous. It's right. ridiculous. There's one person speaking, there's one God speaking, and he said, even my hands. What is he saying? What is it? The essence talking, and then there's six hands? <laughs> I mean, it, it needs to be put out like that so that people understand how ridiculous it sounds. Because that's how it looks. That's If you want to take it to its full extent, that's what you're saying. An essence is talking, and then even my hands, just the nature, is speaking. Right? Even my hands, and there's six hands. There's one person talking, and he's talking about his hands. Like, you have hands. We're made in the likeness and the image of God, right? Right. right. So the same way in which God, I personally am made, it says, in his own image. I'm made in God's image, right? Amen. You know, if I was, if, you know, I don't mean this in any blasphemous way. It's only for an, an, uh, an illustration. If I was the creator of the, world, the, the earth, it would be the same way. I would speak in the same way. I'm one person, and I would say, even I, you know, I don't even want to say Holy One of Israel. It just doesn't feel right. But I would say even my hands. That's the point I wanted to get at. Two hands. Not six hands. It's like hands here, hands there, you know, or hands over here, hands here. It's ridiculous. There's one God and one person. Amen. You know, it's over and over again. I, it's not even meant for my topic, you know. But it's just so clear repeatedly. And, and the, other, the reason why I want to turn to this was because he mentions creating the heavens and the earth. He says he creates man, but then he says he created all those things by his hands. You notice that? See how it's in this case he's not being literal because we know that he created everything in the earth by what? His word, right? We actually see by the, the account being recorded of him creating it by his word. Everything, but then it doesn't say that he said something when he created man. It just says that he formed them, the dust of the earth. Well, we already know that everything was created by his word from John 1, 3. And then we can look at the account and see that everything up until that point was created by his word. So it's very clear, and you can prove this very clearly, that, it, that man was not, you know, I've heard people try to embellish the story kind of like, you know, man, special with God. So God bent down in that dirt, and he got that dirt ready, and he formed man himself. He didn't do that for any other creature. But that's not what the Bible teaches. You can do that to anything, right? You know, I got my southern accent there. Go to Genesis chapter 2. 
Genesis chapter 2. Look at uh, uh, verse 7 again. I want to read this, and then there's one other passage I want to go to. I think I know where it's at. I want to point out first, uh, remind you of what it says. It says there, mid-sentence, and breathe. So after he created man, the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. I want you to turn to, to John. Go to John. I think it's chapter 21. John chapter 21. John chapter number 21. We see a very similar situation. So we see that man was created there. You know, he is, he's not living. He's basically dead. He's, you know, he's never been given life before this, but it's just a dead body. There's no life in the body. But then God breathes into his nostrils, you know, the breath of life, and it says that he becomes a living soul. So he, 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 he comes to life by God's breath. I want you to look at uh, John chapter number 20. I'm sorry, it's John chapter number 20, not 21, chapter number 20, but it's verse 21. I think that's maybe, maybe where I confused it. Verse 21, after Jesus rose again, he comes, and then it says in verse 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And then he says in verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them. So does that sound familiar? But notice this. He breathed on them and sang them. So in tandem or concurrently at the exact same time, when he's, when he's uh, saying this, he's breathing. It's because while you're speaking, you're breathing. It says, and say unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. That is God's spirit and that is the source of all life. It is the Holy Spirit. God is a spirit, and he is the source of all life. And the same way in which when we, we, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is what gives you life. The Bible says the spirit is life because of righteousness. So right there, that is your eternal life or your life. Oh, Steve Anderson tried to attack me for that. I, there, there, I believe that. I didn't say that Jesus received eternal life, but I said that when the Holy Spirit is given to a person, that's what quickens you. The Bible talks about that he quickened us when we're dead in our trespasses and our sins. That's by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is life because of righteousness. Because his Spirit is righteous, he gives it to us. Righteousness has life. If you keep the law, you're righteous, right? right. If you could, you'd be righteous. You would, you know, uh, Paul says that when the, when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So he had life before that because he hadn't broken the law. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? There's a time in which a person receives the law, they understand the law, and then there's a period before you sin. And what are you at that time? You would kind of, in a sense, be righteous, right? But then no one can keep the commandments of God, right? And then it's just like Adam and Eve. There was a time in which they were righteous, right? They never sinned. They were given the commandment. They kept the commandment for a period of time. But then once over a period of time, what happened? They broke the commandment. And what happened? They died. Right? Same thing happens. You know how you're, you're giving your life back? You know how you're giving you know, eternal life? God gives you the Holy Spirit. Amen. That is your life. When he you know, breathed the breath of life, it's the exact same situation as when he gave them the Holy Spirit. He's giving them life. The Spirit is life because of righteousness. He's giving them you know, that down payment of eternal life. That's what's going on. Now, people had eternal security prior to this. So I'm not saying that people didn't weren't, you know, didn't have eternal security. Here's the thing, I can say this, because people say you know, the Bible clearly teaches that the Holy Spirit is a down payment, right? Then the Bible teaches that it's the earnest of our inheritance. What are you saying that the people in the Old Testament didn't have the earnest of their inheritance? You can say the same thing. It's a stupid argument. You're saying the people in the Old Testament didn't have eternal life? Or are you saying that the people in the Old Testament didn't have the earnest of their inheritance? As far as the record goes. Those people were saved when they believed God. God accounted it unto him for righteousness. Do you understand that? But he, he, Abraham did not receive the Holy Spirit at that time. Do you understand what I'm saying? Abraham was not. The Holy Spirit would come upon people, but he did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is the first time that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit was given. That's why we're held to a higher standard in the New Testament. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because you have the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you, and they did it in the Old Testament. You have the, the down payment of your, your salvation, which is the eternal life now. That is the whole point of it. They didn't have that in the Old Testament. They had eternal security, but they didn't already receive that eternal life right then at that moment. They were saved forever, right? And they could never lose their salvation, but they didn't have that down payment yet. But you can see the similarities here, though. Go back to Genesis chapter number 2. When God breathes the breath of life and this dead body is given life, you know... 
You can see the similarity in which Jesus comes. The same God that gave man life came back to man later on. These, these sinful men that put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is, the word, I'm referring to the apostles, and God came and he breathed the breath of life into, into man's nostrils there too. Man was, he was alive as far as he's functioning on earth, but that was the quickening of his spirit right there. Everyone understand what I'm saying? That was, it's the same scenario, right? I believe, although it's not clearly articulated in chapter number two, that God spoke when he did this. I believe when you compare scripture to scripture, God uses his word for everything. Always. God's word always, it's exalted above his name. It's always used for everything. I believe that when it says that he <laughs> breathed the breath of life in Adam's nostrils, I believe he spoke. And at that moment is when he breathed on them. Just like, I breathed on him. Just like when Jesus breathed on them and gave them life. In uh, John chapter number 20, verse number 21, it says that man became a living soul. Look at uh, verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. This is referring to the Garden of Eden. God is doing these things in the Garden of Eden right now is what this is speaking of. Uh, specifically, he's prepping and planting these things, just like it said right before that. That God planted this garden. I bet that that was a, 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 a beautiful garden. God's the one that planted it. Right? Keep reading here. It says in uh, verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. It says the tree of life also in the midst of the garden. So right there in the middle of the garden is the tree of life. And then it says this. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Verse 10. And a river went out of Eden. To part the garden, and from thence it was parted. I'm sorry, went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and, and became into four heads. So while it's in the garden, it's just one river. But once it leaves, you know, it parts and it becomes into four rivers, basically. Four heads, it's saying. Four main streams is why it says heads. <clears throat> and became into four heads. Verse 11, the name of the first is Pison. That, that is only found this one time in the Bible. Uh, Pison. That, that is it which compasses, it says, the whole land of Havilah. Now, I want to show you something very interesting about Havilah. Let's first get a characteristic that's given here. So it says that is, so Pison is the, is the particular river that compasses, and compasses means surrounds, like it goes around it basically. Compasses the whole land of Havilah. So the name of this land is Havilah, it said, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. And then it says, there is delium and onyx stone. So that B is silent when you see words like that, where it's B, D, uh, like, like, like uh, the word, even, uh, I can't think of another example in the Bible. I was going to say subtle. It's the same way with the words, you know, it's not subtle, it's subtle, because the B is silent, right? Uh, when, you, when you read the word S-U-B-T-L-E in the Bible, that B is silent. It is, it's just like debt, the word debt, like you say I'm in debt, you don't say I'm in debt, debt. Right, I can't even say that. Right, you say I'm in debt. The B, when it comes before a T like that, it's silent. So right here, this is, of course, silent as well. Delium and the onyx stone. So this land of Havilah is known for having gold there. Why don't you turn over to Genesis chapter number 10. This is super interesting. Genesis chapter number 10, look at verse number 7. Genesis chapter number 10, verse number 7, the Bible says this. Uh, you know what, I don't may not be actually located here. Go to uh, 2 Chronicles 32.30. I thought that it was here as well. Go to 2 Chronicles 32.30. Let me get to myself. I was looking at that still. I could have sworn it was there in Genesis 10 as well. It's, it's mentioned, but that's not the right passage. 2 Chronicles. Whoops. Way too far. 2 Chronicles, uh, what did I say, 32? 30? That's wrong too. 1 Chronicles chapter 1. Man, 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 23. 1 Chronicles chapter 1. That's a, a citation we're going to go through in here in a minute. I just got my notes mixed up there for a minute. 1 Chronicles chapter 1, look at verse number 23. 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 23. The Bible says this, And Ophir and Havilah and Jobab, all these were the sons of of Joktan. So it says that they are the sons of Joktan. Now notice Havilah was mentioned there, right? Now what was the characteristic, the main characteristic, the first characteristic 
and where the emphasis lied about Havilah in Genesis chapter number 2. What did it say? Yeah, it said there's gold there, and it said the gold there is good. So that's like good gold. That's an area where, you know, gold is, it, that, that area or that land is known for having gold, and it's good gold, right? <coughs> what is, uh, someone that knows the Bible and studies the Bible often, what is the, the place in the Bible, what land in the Bible is most often, often spoken of as having gold? And Solomon, when he builds the temple, he gets gold from here, and Job even mentions this gold. Where? Ophir. Ophir. Now, you know what's interesting is when you look here in 1 Chronicles, chapter number 1, look at verse number 23. So these are brothers. And Ophir and Havilah and Jobab, all these were the sons of Jochim. So you see that Ophir is the brother of Havilah. Ophir is a place of great gold. And Havilah is also a place of great gold. Areas are, all, are always named after people. Right? Even here in the United States, they, 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 uh, especially the Bible, when you look at places in the Bible, they're always named after a person. They'll name it after a person, whatever the land, like the nation of Israel, right? It's the person, Jacob. Always they name it after a person. And you study the Bible, it's, it's uh, consistent, uniform, they're always doing that. So that's what took place here. Now, two brothers, wouldn't it make sense that they would live side by side? Right? They just go and they possess this land. Hey, you go there and you go here, right? But for whatever reason, that particular soil in which they live next to each other was obviously very rich in gold, right? So that's why it spills over into Havilah's land and then it spills over into Ophir's land. There's no way that that's a coincidence that Havilah is, being, is spoken of as, hey, the gold is good there. And then every time you see somebody get gold, it's Ophir. So they both own property right next to one another, just like people also do that in the Bible. And then they name it, like people do in the Bible, after themselves. They name that particular property after themselves, and they just live next to one another. It's very interesting. And you say, why does that matter at all? Because I was reading in 1 Chronicles one time, just doing my daily Bible reading, and came across that verse, and I was like, Havilah? It's like, isn't that, isn't that, the, isn't that the, the land that one of the rivers compasses? So I went back and looked at it, and I was like, I was like, but, but Ophir is where the gold is. What's going on here? And I looked it up again to make sure I wouldn't look, and then I thought about it more and more, and I'm like, oh, they're brothers. And I kind of looked at it. So you think, oh, I'm just, you know, 1 Chronicles is like the drudgery to a lot of people of reading their Bible, isn't it? It's just people are like, oh, man, it's like reading the begat, he begat him, and he begat him. Everybody's like, I'm in 1 Chronicles right now. It's like Leviticus to some people, right? I gotta read 1 Chronicles 1 through 9, right? It's like just all, oh, it's the longest list of genealogies in the entire Bible. But if you pay attention, you'll learn something. It's Amen. all there for a reason. Amen. If you think, don't you? I mean, you're crazy if you think that this is just a bland cross reference. It's just a, it's just a, no, it's just a, I'm making this up. It's just in my mind or something. Everything in the Bible, that's how I know that, that, that this is a, a cross reference. Everything in the Bible is there for a reason. Everything in the Bible is there for a reason. And if you read and you pay attention to the names, you can learn from those names. You can learn from everything. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction. You can learn from all of it. Every single bit of Scripture, you can learn something from. And if you say, well, you know, I've read First Chronicles and I haven't learned anything, then you need to read it more. And read it more. I read the Bible through like, you know, I don't know how many times it was when I found that. 17 or 18 times before I found that reference. It's like four years ago. Three, no, it wouldn't be four years, like a year and a half ago. Yeah, I found that reference. So you'll read the Bible through many times, and then all of a sudden, you know, once you've read Genesis 1 a lot, it's in your mind. Once you've read Job and the story of Solomon, all oh, the gold's in Ophir. Then, like, then you read Havilah, and you're like, I've seen that somewhere else before. You look it up. That's why you got to study your Bibles, too. It's important. Make sure you pay attention on all parts of the Bible. It's all important, is my point. Whether it's 1 Chronicles 1, you know, whether it's Leviticus, it doesn't matter. It's all important, right? Amen. Read all of it and love all of it. The Bible says there in verse number 12, back in chapter 2, verse number 12, uh, I think we'll read this one more time. And the gold of that land is good. There is delium, there is delium and the onyx stone. Verse 13. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. <coughs> We're going to blow through a couple of these references here just real quickly. So I want you to go to, uh, see, I want you to see where this is mentioned. Go to 1 Kings chapter number 1, verse 33. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 33. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 33. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 33. It says, 
The king also said unto them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and cause Solomon my son to ride upon my own mule. And it says, And bring him down to Gihon. So you can see here that there's actually an area that is referred to as Gihon. Because if you've been paying close attention, the, act, the actual river is what we're talking about that is called Gihon. So there's an area also. And this makes perfect sense to me because, you know, uh, I live right on the border of Ohio. And what separates Kentucky and, and Ohio? The Ohio River. So there's a state that's called right after that same river, right? So there's an area also that's known as Gihon, and then there's a river right there that's called the Gihon River. So that's very common, right? I want you to turn to another passage of something real interesting. 2 Chronicles chapter number 32, verse 30. 2 Chronicles chapter number 32, verse 30. 2 Chronicles chapter number 32, verse 30. It says, this same Hezekiah also stopped the upper water course of Gihon and brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David. And Hezekiah prospered in all his works. So we see here Hezekiah actually engineered in some way, which this would be a massive job. People think that, that, that you know, these are just a bunch of goat herders and they were ignorant. I mean, these were, you know, these men were engineers. They planned things out. They would change the entire water course of a, of a massive major river. I mean, that's pretty intense, you know what I mean? You have to plan all this out, and they, they're not just doing it for fun. They're channeling this water so that they can have, you know, some, a, a sense of plumbing, wells, things like that. And actually, I think here's maybe where it's mentioned. Does it talk about the fish gate? I believe in one of these actually mentions the fish gate when he does something like this. So he's, they're using this to like, so they can bring their food closer even. If they want fish, they'll channel the river so that it's not so far away and then they can go, I don't know that's for a fact, but they do this for reasons that are beneficial to them. You know, so it's interesting that he, he changed the entire, the entire course of this river. You know, this particular river that's spoken of in Genesis. He went and stopped the upper course of it and he caused it to go in a different direction, which it was going to benefit the city. So go back to Genesis chapter number 2. Genesis chapter number 2. And think, now, the reason I want to say that is if you try to study the rivers today, you know, uh, the next river that we're going to look at, you know, uh, it seems in a lot of ways to line up with, with a particular river today. That's the river Euphrates. Where they think the river Euphrates is today, they, they say it, they believe it, you know, it lines up and it would be the same river of the Bible. It makes a lot of sense. But, but uh, it's hard sometimes to identify these rivers because they change course like that. People change, can change the course, and they can interrupt the, the, the channel, the direction that the river's channeling in. But then just over time, you know, it can, it can, you know, uh, it can eat through different, you know, directions and things like that. So if we were to try to look for these rivers today, it may be difficult. And, and some of them, some of them may still exist, the point I want to make. But the next, it says this, verse 14, in the name of, uh, in the, name of the third river is <coughs> Hittichel. That's only mentioned one other time in the Bible. That's in Daniel chapter 10. Daniel 10 is where the angel comes to Daniel and interprets for him, you know, uh, basically all the things about the Antichrist and the kingdom that's going to be here in the last, in the end. And he says that he was by the river of Hittichel. So that's the same river that's spoken up here, I'm sure. Uh, and then it says this, that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria that says, and the fourth river is Euphrates. There is a river of, uh, you know, that's referred to as Euphrates today. You guys went to Iraq, didn't you? You actually went to Iraq? You did not. You did. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the at the map, you know, do you know, did you, were you around where the, never went to Euphrates. you never did? Well, it starts like up in, uh, I believe it's Turkey up north, right? And then Iraq is like, if we were looking at it like this, isn't Iraq like here and Turkey's here? I know it channels down to uh, the Persian uh, Gulf. I know that Euphrates and Tigris. Have you ever heard of the Tigris as well? That's just talked up to. And uh, the it channels down into the uh, into the Persian. And it goes through like Turkey and then like uh, where like uh, Assyria was and all of that. And then it like goes right by where Babylon, ancient Babylon, was located as well. And then it goes straight into the Persian Gulf. So it basically goes at an angle. So it's pretty far from like Israel would be like here. And then, you know, the river, like, goes in this direction, and Babylon was, would be over that did nothing for you just now, that little <laughs> thing here. Yeah. I want you to look at uh, verse number 15. You can look it up on a map. It's, it's interesting. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. One thing we can learn from this is that God created man to work even when he was in paradise. 
He yeah. created him to dress it and to keep it. God made a beautiful garden and he put man in there. He said, I want you to dress it and I want you to keep it. So Adam was walking around. So there's nothing wrong with being in lawn care, right? Yeah. Now, that's a manly job, right? Yeah. God, the first man was created. He was put in the garden and God said, go cut the grass and make it look good, right? Yeah. That's, right. A, that's the first man's job. Yeah. Yeah. You can, that's a pretty good verse right there. You could put a you know, box lawn care. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Amen. Just made you millions of dollars. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Look at the next verse there, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. I want you to keep your hand here. I want to point something out to you that you may have never noticed. A very, very famous verse we use, soul winning, Romans chapter number 6. I want you to turn there quickly. We use this all the time. I don't know if when you read through in, in Genesis, if you've ever noticed this. But if you look at verse 16, he says at the end, God, of every tree of the garden thou mayest what? Freely eat. So what, what's going to happen if he eats of this other tree? But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. It's not going to be free. What does that mean? It's going to cost you something. Look at Romans chapter number 6, verse number 23. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. That's because there's a wage for breaking God's law. You know, God gives you a commandment. He says, don't eat of this tree. You want to do it? God gives you free will. But it's going to cost you something. It's free to eat all the other trees. And you see how man is. God just says you can eat every single tree that I've made. Even the tree of life. But there's this one tree. I just don't want you to touch it. And people are like, oh, man's good. Man at his core, at, his at the core of his nature, he's a good person. You think of the scenario that man was handed. You can eat anything you want. You can do anything. I just have this one tree. Don't eat it. And then what happens? He eats of it. We're sinners, at, you know. We have we when man is left to his own devices, it's just corruption. You know, we're given free will. God does not force us to do either one. He, he doesn't. He, you know, ca you know, Calvinism is, is is not scriptural. Man, but man is you know a sinner. Man is a sinner, and he will you know continue to sin until our bodies are redeemed. And, and God uh, redeems us from this corruptible body. Once you go back to Genesis chapter number 2, I want you to uh, keep your hand. Are you still in Genesis? If you're in Genesis 2, actually stay in Romans. If you haven't dropped Romans yet, I did. I'll catch it real quick. I want you to flip over one page. Look also at Romans chapter number 7. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 7. I'll read from you Genesis 2 again real quick. It says this, For in the day that thou eatest thereof, speaking of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Everyone here is familiar with the story of Adam and Eve. And they did not physically die that day, did they? Did they physically die? Did they drop dead? It's not like that, that whatever fruit this was, that it had poison and they bit of it and then died. No, they did not physically die that day. The Bible talks about uh, a spiritual death and they spiritually died that day. I want you to look at Romans chapter number 7. <clears throat> look at it, verse number 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I have not known sin but by the law. For I have not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Verse 8. But sin taking occasion, I'm sorry, but sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law sin was dead. Then he says this. This is Paul speaking. For I was alive without the law once. So he's saying there was one time in which I was alive without the law. He's saying where he didn't understand the law, right? Then he says this, but when the commandment came, and we use this expression all the time, oh, it just came to me. What is he saying? You just understood it for, for the first time. Oh, you just remembered it. It popped into your mind, right? He's saying when the commandment came to him and he got it, he understood it. Once it sunk in, hey, don't lust after that. Don't <clears throat> take things from people. Don't lie about stuff, right? He was alive at one point that says, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So there was a time in which Paul was alive as well in his life, right? 
And then someone gave him the commandment. He understood the commandment. It could have been by his own conscience. The Bible talks about our conscience bearing witness in our hearts, the, the, with our hearts, that the commandment's written in our hearts and we can understand it. You get to a certain age, whether you're a barbarian or what, where you understand that certain things are wrong. It's wrong to lie. It's wrong to murder. It's wrong to do these things. That's why every society has laws according to that, right? And you understand that, and then you break that law, and you die. Paul, was Paul physically dead? No, he's writing an epistle. He spiritually died. His, his spirit died. That goes back again to you know, Jesus giving, us, giving the, the apostles life. You know, he's breathing on them, and he's giving them what? Spiritual life. Right? He, he's giving them spiritual life and quickening their spirit. The Bible talks about our spirits being quickened at the moment that we are saved. Why? Because our spirits are dead. Because after you sin, you die spiritually. And the same exact thing happened with Adam and Eve. The moment that they ate of it, in the day, he says, that you eat of it, you'll surely die. He said, you'll for sure die. We know that that's true, right? They spiritually die. Once you go back and look at verse number 18, Genesis chapter number 2. Verse number 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. It's, uh, meet right there does not mean mate, like a helpmate. Some people, I'll, I'll hear people word this kind of incorrectly and use it that way. Has anybody heard people do that before? I've heard that plenty of times. Uh, where people will think that this is saying like, the word meet right there means fit. Like he's made for him. He's perfect for him. You know what I mean? He's appropriate. If you know what I'm saying, like they're for each other. He's saying I'm going to make him a help fit for him, like for him specifically, right? I want you to keep that in mind because people say something real weird here and there. Now, I'll, I'm going to show you why that's wrong when you have the, under, the right understanding of this. So he's saying I'm going to make him a help fit for him. It's made just for him. Now look at verse number 19. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam. So we know when we read earlier in Genesis 1 that he created all of these animals before he created man. Right? But what's going on here is after God created man, now he is again in front of God, in front of uh, man, Adam, he's creating all of these animals again individually, each one. So keep reading there. It says, Unto Adam to see what he would call them. So that's the, the purpose of this. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Why? Because God gave man dominion over these animals. So he, you know, uh, referred to these animals whatever terms that he wanted to use. Verse 20, it says this, And Adam gave names unto all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. And then it says this, But for Adam, there was not found an help me for him. So I've heard atheists mock this and say, Well, God was trying to get Adam to like, you know, amongst the animals, there wasn't found a help me for him. Because God was bringing all these animals, Hey, do you like this animal, Adam? Do you like this animal, Adam? And he's like, But there wasn't found help me for him. That is not what this is saying. It tells you, number one, why he brought the animals to him. To name them. And do you know what it's saying? And I want you to look again at verse number 18. It says, I will make it help meet for him, like a help that's fit for him. When he created all of the beasts and all of the cattle and everything, he created them and he blessed them and said what? Be fruitful and multiply. So what did they have? They had a, they had a, let, let's use it this way. Help me. Right. Yeah, yeah. Let's use, let's use that word now. They had help me. So he brings all these animals to him, like basically male and female, and he calls them whatever he wants. And they have a help me, but there was not a help me, like feet fit for Adam. It says, that's why it says but. They have one, but negating it, he doesn't have one. Atheists, you know, are some stupid people sometimes in a lot of ways. That's what this is teaching. That's why it first says, I will make it help meet for him, fit for him. And then he brings the animals to him. He names all of them and it says, but there was not one for Adam. Because there was one for them, but not one for Adam. That's what it's saying. Everyone, that make, is that clear to everybody? Amen. Look at verse number uh, 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. There, uh, this happens one other time when, when God causes Abraham. We're not going to turn there real quick. I don't remember exactly where it's at. But God causes a, a deep sleep to come upon Abraham. And he gives him a vision and tells him about how they're going to be going into... I'm trying to hurry up right now. Uh, we're going a little bit long. But he tells him how they're going to be going into uh, Egypt at that time. So he does that exact... This is the first minimally, minimally invasive surgery that's ever taken place. And it says that he closed up the flesh instead thereof, right? 
Look at verse number 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. So he used that rib and he made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Who has ever heard that man has one less rib than women? I've heard it my whole life. You know that's not true, right? right. It's not true. But there is uh, a pretty cool little truth about that. That there is like a bottom rib that on one side it's called a floating rib or something like that. And uh, this, is, this is for sure, you know, this is science, you know, scientific. And they can take that rib out and it will regenerate. That's super interesting. That is. Take that rib out and then they'll grow another, you know, they'll grow that rib back. So if there's some surgery or something that needs to be done, whatever it is, they need to get to something, they can remove that rib. And then that rib, I mean a bone even, you know what I mean? That's interesting. And it will just grow back. You know, that's, that's extremely, and just over and over and over again, the Bible, in light of science, they, it, when it's true science, it always makes perfect sense. Look at verse number 23. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, and then it says this, because she was taken out of man. All throughout the Bible, the Bible will give you some, a name of, of something, someone, a place, or whatever, and then it'll say because or for, it means the same thing, those are synonymous. For in the Bible often mean, most of the time means because. It'll say for this, for like Jesus, he shall save his people from their sins. He's called Jesus and that, that actually means he's going to, he's a savior, you know, and uh, he's going to save people basically. You know, he is the savior, Jehovah is the savior. So it's telling you what that name means. So what woman actually means, you know, man obviously means man, and the wolf, that, that prefix there means out of. So it's saying out of man. So she's called woman because she was taken out of man. And uh, there's a, a place in the Bible, I can't remember exactly where it's at right now, where the Bible actually talks about where, um, you know, I think it might be in 1 Corinthians 11, where, you know, how there's man... And then from man, woman was created. And then from every woman came all of mankind. Because she's the mother of all living, it said to be later. So you see like an interesting symbiotic relationship that takes place there where it's like Adam, you know, uh, Eve. And then out of that woman from which she came from man, every living creature, you know, as far as, as human beings came from her. Because she's the mother of all living. It's very interesting with the symbiotic relationship that, that's made there. But you know what is very important about this to husbands and wives is that your wife is, is a help that's meet for you. God specifically created men and women for one another. And your wife is fit for you. And she's made of your very bone and of your very flesh so that you would have a very close relationship. I personally believe that you, know, you can have other best friends that are men, but I think that your wife should be your top number one best friend. Amen. You should be the closest person in your, in your life. If you want to talk about something to somebody, you should go to your wife and talk to her about this, Amen. whatever this thing may be. You should have not just a, a relationship of just like closeness of loving each other, but you should have a close relationship just where you just speak to one another, where you're just, you, just, you, know, you, just, you can relate to one another is what I'm getting at. You know, on the same level because you are what? You know, she was taken out of man for that very reason. She's bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. There was a, uh, an evangelist who probably, you know, uh, doesn't like me anymore. I don't know if he doesn't. Actually, I spoke to him before we left. And, and uh, maybe, he hasn't heard my, maybe he's heard my preaching since then. But uh, this guy's name is Phil Skipper. He's a really good guy. And uh, I really like Phil Skipper. And I, he always calls his wife, like, all the time. My rib. My rib's, you know, with me today. My rib's with me today. And I, and I thought about that. It's funny, but uh, I thought about that, but it, it's real interesting because you, know, you can ch pick and choose who you want to marry, right? But he's like, that's my rib. Like, she's created for me. You know what I mean? And that's the attitude that you should have about your wife. You know, you could have picked and chosen whoever you want, but you know, the one that you have, make it to the, the relationship to where it's like God created her for you. She's fit for you. You know, have a perfect, the, the closest to, to perfect relationship that you can have. But not only a relationship of just where you love one another because of the, the you know, the, the, the magnetism is in, you know, uh, men and women. The attraction because we are male and female, the difference there. But because we are similar also, and she is bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. That's why... She's fit for you because she was taken out of man. So God wanted it to be a close relationship. Uh, further proof of that is if you look at this passage, it says, she shall be called, or it says, this, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. 
the relationship between um, the, ch the local church and Christ is referred to a very, very similar situation where they are one body, right? And how close a relationship should we have with Christ? I mean, can you even put it into words? You can't, right? You know, we should have as close as we can possibly have. Well, that's the, that's, if those two things are similar, then that's the type of, that's what you should strive for with your wife. As close as relationship as you, as you should have with your wife. <clears throat> Look at verse number 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So see the unity and the clothing. And that's not just Adam and Eve. That you can't be talking about Adam and Eve because he says they're going to leave father and mother. You know, the, you know, that starts when it starts talking about, you know, uh, beyond Adam and Eve, right? And if you're wondering, Adam did not have a belly button. And we will split this church if people want to argue with me. No, I'm just kidding. You know, see, see people arguing about that, but Adam didn't have a belly button. Does everybody know where a belly button comes from, right? An umbilical cord, right? How could you even? Adam did not have a belly button. Right? He didn't have an umbilical cord. We'll argue about this later, right? But uh, you can see the closest again there, how they are one flesh, right? They're one flesh. So this is talking about, you know, men and women of the future, not Adam and Eve. So you say, oh, that's just Adam and Eve. They're supposed to have that bond because she was fit for him. Nope. Because it says right after that, in the same way in which Adam and Eve, you know, they're one flesh. You know, though they're going to leave father and mother. Adam and Eve didn't have a father and mother, Right? They were the first, you know, man and woman. They shall leave father and mother. And it says, and it says they'll cleave unto his, it's speaking of man, cleave unto his wife. And they, they shall be one flesh. So there should be a close bond unity with your wife. Look at verse, and that's quoted by Jesus. Uh, showing, in, in, in Matthew 19, Jesus quotes this when he's talking about the subject of, of divorce. We shouldn't divorce. It's wrong, Right? And he quotes this passage. That just shows that G now, if you reject the book of Genesis and that this is a literal account, well, now you're questioning Jesus' validity because he believed it was true. And he, he believed it was so true that he quoted it to support his philosophy. Look at verse 25. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, dispensationalism, you know, they create all these different divisions of time, right? We'll end on this note. They create all this di these different divisions of time. And they say there was a time of an age of innocence. And there's a, there's a little bit of truth in, in every lie, but there's, there's a little bit of truth that you can find spread throughout dispensationalism. And of course this was an age, if you want to say age of innocence, right? But it's the exact same way. It's not just that period of age. With, that age was the only time when there was innocence. You look at this on a personal level. Your children go through a time of innocence, don't they? Well, the same thing happened. That begins at the beginning of their life, and then it goes to the point in time until they sin for the first time. Well, the same thing happened with that. And, you know, the things of, of, of dispensationalism, it's funny because they actually apply to each individual person always. You're under innocence, you know, the age of innocence for a period of time. And then once you receive the law, you're under the law for a period of time, aren't you? Until you sin, right? And then you get under grace after that when you believe. Anybody ever thought of that? And then you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's more of a, it's, that's the truth. You know, uh, dispensation, it's dispensed to each, it's each man. You understand what I mean? The different ages, you know, different time periods or phases of man's life, really, is the way that that works out. So well, they weren't ashamed because they were innocent at this time. Just like a child, when he has never sinned, he doesn't understand the difference, you know, between that which is right or wrong. Or, you know, there's nothing for them to be ashamed of at this time anyways. When they sin later, of course, they do become ashamed, but that is because they have a guilty conscience, because they've now sinned. Right? So they are innocent is what's going on right now. That's why they're not ashamed now, but they become ashamed when they sin later. Because they're innocent at this point in time. They've not yet sinned. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for Genesis chapter 2. Help us just to love all the Bible, dear Lord God. Help us to learn from it, dear Heavenly Father. Help us to be diligent uh, students of your word. To be with us and bless every single family here. And uh, please, Lord, just help our church to grow. Help us to do that which is right. So we can have your blessing upon this church. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.